Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. For he will judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Psalm 96. This is one of my favorite psalms in all of the psalms, and it's one of the great missionary psalms. And in Psalm 96 tonight, we are going to see God's burning heart for the nations. For weeks now, on Wednesday night, we've been looking at a little bit of what the Bible has to say about identity. And tonight, we've reached the final phase of this series, in which we are going to start looking at the question, who are we? Who are we as a local church? And what we're going to see tonight is that we are on a mission. The first truth we're going to see in Psalm 96 is that God desires the worship of all the nations. Look with me in Psalm 96, starting in verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. What we see in this passage is that God wants people from every ethnicity, every people group, every tribe to worship him. God wants people from every language and every dialect to join together in one voice to sing praises to him. And God has given us, his followers, a big part in making this happen. In fact, isn't that what it said in verse 2? God says, proclaim the good news of his salvation to all the peoples of the nations. What is the good news? The good news is that even though we're sinners, God has made a way for us to get right with him. And it's a way that's very different than from what most people think. You see, all religions are not the same. Every other religion on earth is about what we try to do to get ourselves to God. And so all over the world, there are billions of people who are tirelessly, hopelessly trying to earn their way to salvation. Whether it's the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church, whether it's the five pillars of Islam, whether it's the eightfold path of Buddhism. But true biblical Christianity is not about what we do to get ourselves to God. It's about what God has done to get to us. It's about what God has done to bring us back to himself. Because we've all sinned, we all are separated from God and deserve judgment. But the good news is that God loves us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus. And Jesus did everything it takes for us to be saved. He died on the cross for our sins. He lived the perfect life in our place. He came back from the dead to prove that he really was everything he said he was. And now because of what Jesus has done, all of us have an opportunity. Anyone who will turn away from their old life and stop trusting in their own goodness, but instead turn to Jesus and start trusting in his goodness and put their faith in Jesus alone for their salvation, can be forgiven of all of their sins, can begin a personal relationship with Jesus, and can know for sure that they'll go to heaven when they die. That's the good news that we are supposed to be sharing with all the nations. And God wants us to share this message with all of the peoples of the earth. That's why God gave us the Great Commission. 
Now, this great commission idea is not just in this psalm. This is something we see throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in every major division of Scripture, from beginning to end we see God's burning heart that people from all nations would be saved. For example, we see God's plan as early as the book of Genesis. Look with me in Genesis chapter 12. This is one of the times that God was making promises to Abraham. And in Genesis 12, starting in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We see in this passage that God promised Abraham that God would make his descendants into a mighty nation. But God also promised Abraham that he would have one special descendant who would be a blessing to all the nations. And now we know who that descendant is, don't we? Who is the descendant of Abraham who came to be a blessing to all nations? Jesus, right? Jesus is that special descendant. We see God's heart here in Genesis 12. Let me show you another example in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 49. This is one of what's called the servant songs in the book of Isaiah, which are prophecies about Jesus who is to come. And in this verse, we see a conversation between God the Father and God the Son who became Jesus Christ. And so in this verse, God is talking to Jesus, giving Jesus his mission. And so look what it says in Isaiah chapter 49, starting in verse 6. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation. How far? To the ends of the earth. What was Jesus' mission? To bring salvation to the Jewish people. But not just the Jewish people, because that would be too small of a mission for someone like Jesus. Jesus' mission was not just to bring salvation to the Jewish people, but also to bring salvation to all peoples, because that's the only mission big enough for a Savior as big as Jesus. This theme carries right on into the New Testament. Look with me at Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. We call this the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. In this commission, in this command, Jesus gives us the mission that the Christian church is supposed to be doing. What are we supposed to be doing as a church? Making disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is a Christ follower, and we are supposed to be cooperating with the Holy Spirit, being used by God to help people become and grow as Christ followers. How do we do that? Well, the good news is we don't have to make it up. Jesus told us how to do it. By going, by baptizing, by teaching. First of all, by going. You see, Jesus' expectation is not that we huddle inside of our church walls and hope that the nations come to us. His expectation, his command, is that we go to the nations. Sociologists have told us that there's something like 11 and a half thousand different people groups on earth. And why that's important is because this word nations that we're supposed to make disciples of is the Greek word ethne. Now often it gets translated as nations, but it's, it's slightly misleading to the modern ear because when we hear the word nations, we think of geopolitical units. We think of countries with defined boundaries. But this Greek word ethne is where we get our modern word ethnicities from. And so probably the clearest way to understand what nations means in this passage is ethnicities, ethno-linguistic people groups. And like I was saying, sociologists say there's 11,500 different ethnicities on earth. Did you know that? If I had given you a piece of paper when you walked in and said, write down as many ethnicities as you can think of, how many would you have gotten? 20, 30, 
40, there's 11 and a half thousand different ethnicities of people on earth. And Jesus has told us to make disciples of all of them by going, also by baptizing. When we go and share the message of Jesus' salvation, there's going to be some who believe in Jesus. And those who believe in Jesus should be baptized. Now, what's baptism? There's a lot of confusion about baptism. Some people think that baptism has magic powers, but we believe Jesus has all the power. Some people believe that baptism can wash away sins, but we believe the Bible teaches that only Jesus can wash away sins when we believe in Him. Some people believe that baptism can make you go to heaven, but we believe that the Bible says the only way to go to heaven is about believing in Jesus. It's all about believing in Jesus. Well, then what's baptism? Baptism is the way that someone who's already believed in Jesus, someone who's already been forgiven of their sins by faith, someone who's already on their way to heaven, stands up and publicly announces their faith in Jesus. When someone gets baptized, they get dunked under the water and they get pulled out. And what they're doing is they're putting on a little symbolic play. They're saying, I want everybody to know that I believe that Jesus was alive, that he died on the cross and was buried for my sins, and that he came back up from the grave three days later. Going, baptizing, and then teaching to obey. Once someone has believed in Jesus and been baptized, then we teach them to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. How do we do that? By incorporating them into the life and ministry of a local church. And then that local church, as a faith family, works together to teach that new believer how to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. At the end of the Bible, we find a beautiful picture of people from every tribe, every language, every people, every tongue, worshiping God in heaven. Look with me at Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 9. This is a vision that John had of heaven. And he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, from this very, very brief survey of missions in the Bible, what we see is that God's heart for the nations permeates all of Scripture. It seems like the Great Commission is pretty important to God. But sadly, the Great Commission is not always as important to God's people. In far too many churches, the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. The main thing that Jesus has commanded us to do is often the main thing that we leave out. But I am so thankful that Valley Baptist Church is a church that is focused on international missions. Amen? One of the most exciting things about our church is how God has been working through us to reach the nations in ways that you might not even be aware of. Um, Let me share just a tiny bit of the history of missions here at Valley Baptist Church, okay? In 1988, Pastor Roger led the first short-term trip from our church to the country of Trinidad. In 1995, a woman named Donna Robinson, who was a member of our church, answered God's call and became a missionary to Eastern Europe with the IMB. The IMB is the International Mission Board. That's the mission sending organization of the Southern Baptist Convention. So Donna was the first full-time international missionary sent out from Valley Baptist Church. In 1999, Valley started sending a ton of short-term mission trips out into the nations, especially to Central America to help a missionary named Steve Kern. Many of you have probably been on a trip with Steve Kern. Since then, Valley has indirectly supported the launch of dozens and dozens of new churches in in, uh, Central America, but we've directly helped start five different churches in Central America, two in El Salvador, one in Managua, Nicaragua, one in Guatemala City, and one in Bogota, Colombia. Around the same time, the IMB needed churches to help them reach unengaged people groups. What's an unengaged people group? Well, remember that there's 11,500 different people groups, different ethnicities on earth. Of those 11,500, there are about 3,000 that are classified as unengaged. What does that mean? Well, that means that not only are there basically no Christians in that people group, 
but it means that there's not even any Christians trying to reach that people group. What it means to be unengaged is that basically there are no missionaries trying to engage that people group with the gospel. And so the IMB realized that that need was so great that their resources weren't enough to reach 3,000 unengaged people groups anytime soon. And so they sent out a red alarm emergency call and they made a plea to the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention. And they said, hey, we've got all of our missionaries out working and they are working hard, but we need some help. What we need is some churches to step up and volunteer to adopt one of the 3,000 unengaged people groups and to go after them. And so Valley volunteered to adopt one of these people groups. And so we partnered with an IMB missionary named Chris Ammons to reach a people called the Ashaninka. Now, Ashaninka literally means assassins. And this was a primitive tribe of indigenous peoples that were living in Peru in the jungles along the Amazon River. And so people from Valley worked with the Ashaninka for eight years, traveling up and down the Amazon River, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. And by God's grace, he used the valley to help start what's called an indigenous church planting movement. What does that mean? That means when the people from the tribe get so saved that they start sending out their own missionaries. And so the Ashaninka started sending out missionaries up and down the Amazon River to other tribes that were around them. After that, Valley partnered with the IMB to reach yet another indigenous tribe, this time called the Amarca Yeti. The Amarca Yeti lived in one of the most remote places on earth. They had little contact with the outside world and basically no contact with Christianity. And people from Valley were present when the first of many Amarca Yeti gave their lives to Jesus. Can you imagine what that would have been like to be there and see the first people of a tribe give their lives to Jesus? Valley worked with them for two more years after that and since then many others have been saved. Nine years ago, Valley partnered with the IMB to embrace yet another unengaged tribe, this time the Mixteco Tijoltepec of southern Mexico. And I've had the privilege of being on two of those trips to the Mixteco, Mixteco Tijoltepec. I was on the first trip ever when we went to their village, and then I was on a, another trip as well. And since then, there have been people from the tribe who have been saved and baptized, and as we speak, there is a Christian church now that is meeting every single Sunday in their town. Now, remember that Valley has sent a ton of short-term trips all over the place. In fact, did you know Valley has sent right around a hundred short-term mission trips out into the nations? In fact, as we speak, there are people from Valley right now on a short-term mission trip to Rwanda. So don't forget to be praying for them. They are there right now sharing the good news of Jesus. Now, remember Donna Robinson that I mentioned earlier? She was a woman from our church who was our church's first full-time international missionary. Well, Donna influenced another woman in the church named Karen Watson. Karen went on a short-term mission trip to El Salvador, and while she was in El Salvador on this short-term trip, she felt called into full-time missions. And so Karen left her job with the Sheriff's Department, and she joined the IMB. In 2003, she finally got her assignment. She was being sent to Baghdad, Iraq. Now remember that 2003 was the year that the war in Iraq started. And tragically, in 2004, Karen and her team were brutally murdered by Islamic extremists. They were gunned down in the streets of Mosul. Before she left to be a missionary, she left behind a letter to be read in the event of her death. And so I want to take a couple moments and I want to read the full letter tonight. I think the text of the letter should be up on the screen if you want to follow along. <clears throat> March 7, 2003. Dear Pastor Phil and Pastor Roger, you should only be opening this letter in the event of death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place, I was called to Him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory was my reward. His glory is my reward. One of the most important things to remember right now is to preserve the work. 
I am writing this as if I am still working among my people group. I thank you all so much for your prayers and support. Surely your reward in heaven will be great. Thank you for investing in my life and spiritual well-being. Keep sending missionaries out. Keep raising up fine young pastors. In regards to any service, keep it small and simple. Yes, simple. Just preach the gospel. If Jason Buss is available or his dad, have them sing a pretty song. Be bold and preach the life-saving, life-changing, forever eternal gospel. Give glory and honor to our Father. The missionary heart, care more than some think is wise. Risk more than some think is safe. Dream more than some think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. I was not called to comfort or success, but to obedience. Some of my favorite scriptures are Isaiah 6, you know the one, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 21, 1 Peter 1, 3, Colossians 4, 2 through 6, Romans 15, 20, Psalm 25 and 27. You can look through my Schofield Bible and see where it is marked. Please only use what you want or feel is best. There is no joy outside of knowing Jesus and serving him. I love you too and my church family. In his care, shalom, Karen. This is the letter that that song that we sung earlier was based on. Karen was a real life modern day martyr. She was targeted and killed for trying to take the gospel to the people of Iraq. Now, you would think that if a woman from our church went to be a missionary and was killed, you would think that nobody from our church would ever go to be a missionary again. But what actually happened was the exact opposite. Since then, more full-time missionaries have gone out of our church than ever before. They've been inspired by Karen's sacrifice. In fact, right now we have eight full-time missionaries serving among the nations from our church. Two in Asia, two in Europe, two in Papua New Guinea, and two in restricted areas that I can't mention right now. Let's look back at Psalm 96. This time let's look at Psalm 96 starting in verse 4. <clears throat> For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. You see, God is not content to share His glory with other so-called gods. There have been far too many worship songs sung to Baal and Asheroth, Jupiter and Zeus, Vishnu and Allah. How sad it is that the peoples of the earth have wasted their whole lives worshiping gods that aren't even real. Worshiping gods that do not exist and cannot help them. God, our God, the God of the Bible, is the one and only true God and He alone deserves to be worshiped. Which brings us to the second point tonight. Not only does God desire the worship of all the nations, God deserves the worship of all the nations. Look with me again at Psalm 96, this time starting in verse 7. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established, it shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Notice in verse 8 that it says that all the nations should give to the Lord the glory due His name. You see there's been a debt that's been building up for a long time. There's been a debt that's been building up ever since mankind first fell into sin and stopped giving glory to God like He deserves. And during every hour that has passed since then, that debt has increased and increased and increased. None of us have given God all the glory that He's due, and there's many people on earth who haven't given God any glory at all. And that should break our hearts. I mean, think of how you would feel if someone else got the credit for something you did. I mean, what if you're at work and you spent years on some big important project and it was a huge success and it really just propelled your business to the next level? And then imagine 
that the boss gave the credit to somebody else and gave someone else the promotion for the work that you did. When did that bug you? Well, it should bug us that God is not getting the glory that he's due. We should not be able to stand that people are giving away the glory that God alone deserves. We should be dying to do something about it. And the good news is that Jesus has given us something to do about it, the Great Commission. John Piper says that missions exist because worship doesn't. The third and final truth we're going to see from Psalm 96 tonight is not only does God desire the worship of all the nations, not only does God deserve the worship of all the nations, but God will receive the worship of all the nations. Look with me in Psalm 96 starting in verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. This part of the psalm reminds us that Christ is coming back. And when he does, he will rule over the nations and people from all the nations will worship him. At Jesus' second coming, he will finally deal with all the evil of this world. He will finally fix everything that's broken in this messed up world that we live in. And he will rule the world with truth and justice. We'll no longer have to put up with all the problems that have plagued our human governments. Pride, prejudice, corruption, secret agendas, oppression, and tyranny. In the end, people from every tribe, nation, and tongue will be rejoicing and worshiping the one true God. God desires worship from all the nations. God deserves worship from all the nations. And God will receive worship from all the nations. What's the application of all that for us tonight? Well, I believe that the application of this is that every believer in our church should be helping to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to all the nations. You see, the Great Commission is not just for a few elite. It's not just for a a small band of super Christians. The Great Commission was given to all believers. And so if you're a believer here tonight, then the Great Commission was given to you. God's plan is for all of us to be involved with how Valley is reaching the nations. And there are three basic ways to be involved in the Great Commission. To pray, to give, to go. To pray. Ask yourself, you don't have to answer out loud, how much of your prayer life is spent praying for missions? How often do you pray for mission trips, or for missionaries, or for parts of the world that desperately need some missionaries? Remember, one of the specific things Jesus commanded us to pray for is to pray the Father that the Lord of the harvest would send out more workers into the fields. And so how often in our prayer time do we pray anything about missions or about the nations? I want to give you a challenge tonight. You'll notice on your table that you've got two handouts. They look alike. There we go. They look alike, but they're actually two different handouts. And uh, there's enough for everybody there. And so I encourage you to take home one of each. One of these handouts is a list of, Lord willing, the trips that we're planning on going on in 2020. So this is a list of short-term mission trips that Valley is planning to send to the nations in 2020. The other list is a list of the four families from our church who are serving as international missionaries out there in the nations. And so one thing I will say is please don't post any of this information online. So some of these missionaries are serving in very dangerous places, and so please don't post any of this online. Um, But what these can be for you is these can be prayer guides. In fact, the challenge I want to leave with you is tonight, before you go to bed, to pray through both of these lists, okay? To help us get started praying for missions. So we can pray. We can also give. Now, if you've ever given to the general ministry fund of Valley Baptist Church, then whether or not you knew it, you've already given to missions. Because what we do as a church is we take a portion of everything that our church members tithe, and we send that off to help support missionaries. And so over the years, you, the people of Valley Baptist Church, have given millions and millions of dollars to help support missionaries. 
Sometimes people want to give above and beyond their regular tithe to directly support certain missionary causes. For instance, there's probably not a week that goes by that we don't have somebody on Sunday morning write the word missions on their envelope when they're making a gift. Or for example, we have the Lottie Moon Christmas offering coming up soon. And what that is, that's an, an a offering that Southern Baptist churches receive and 100% of that offering goes directly to on the field IMB missionaries. Another example is that a lot of people will help other people out in the church when they're going on short term mission trips. One thing that all these mission trips have in common is that all of them are gonna have people on the trip who need help financially. And so our church has always been so generous when they know that someone in their life group is going on a mission trip to help financially send them on those mission trips. So we can pray, we can give, we also can go. You can go on a short-term mission trip. One of the reasons why I gave you this list is so you can be praying through it and thinking about if there's one of these trips that maybe you should be going on. And at the bottom of the list, uh, we have Pastor Jeremy's contact information. Pastor Jeremy is our missions pastor. Jeremy, can you raise your hand again? There he is. And um, so if you have questions about any of these trips or if you want to find out more or might be interested in going on one of these trips, then contact him and he can help you out. I've been on, I'm starting to lose track, but I think I've been on maybe 12 mission trips and every one of them has been the best week of my Christian life. I mean, it's just incredible how much people grow spiritually when they go on a short-term evangelistic mission trip. I mean, there is nothing like it for spiritual growth. It's like a shot of spiritual steroids, or as Pastor Phil describes it, it's like getting slimed. So that's what Pastor Phil says. <clears throat> so you can go short-term, you might be getting called to go long-term. It's possible that God is calling someone in here to be a long-term, full-time international missionary. If we're going to obey Jesus, those are the three options. Like John Piper said, pray, give, go, or disobey. One way or another, all of us is supposed to be involved helping take the message of God and God's salvation to all the nations, no matter how isolated, no matter how hostile, no matter how remote. Because people from this church answered God's call, there are now praise songs coming from the Ashaninka. Because people from this church answered God's call, there are now praise songs coming from the Amarkieti. Because people from this church answered God's call, there are now praise songs coming from the Mixteco to Haltepec. But what about the rest of the people? What about the rest of the nations? What about the rest of the ethne? There are no songs coming from the Maga Hot in the Philippines. There are no songs of praise coming from the Zoko in Brazil. None of the Bedouin of Libya are giving God glory. The Parsi of Sri Lanka are not rejoicing in the Lord. And the Yakut of China do not know the good news. What are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Because we are on a mission. Let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for Jesus, that he came and lived the perfect, sinless life in our place, and that he died on the cross to take the punishment that we deserved. God, I thank you, Lord, that he rose back from the dead, conquering death, that he ascended back to the right hand of the Father, and he's seated there on his right hand. And Lord, we know that one day Jesus is coming back to set everything straight. But until then, Lord, we know that Jesus has given us a mission, a mission to make disciples of all the nations. And so God, one way or another, I pray that all of us would get busy carrying out that mission. God, I pray right now for our team that's in Rwanda, that you would bless them, that you would protect them, but more than anything, that you will make them bold in love and courage to share your love and the message of your salvation with people who need to hear it. Please, Lord, guide them and bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.